Welcome back to the American Dream. This is Terry Roche, your co-host and realtor with Keller Williams Realty. Uh, today, I am joined by Josh Burris. Josh is the Executive Vice President of Intercoastal Mortgage, one of the largest mortgage companies on the East Coast. And today, we are going to talk about something that you don't even know has happened yet, but it's going to impact you, the value of your house, uh, ultimately your retirement, uh, the value of access you have to money, all kinds of things. But there's something under the radar that nobody even knows has happened yet and people making plans and they're going to be in quite a, for quite a surprise. Josh, um, welcome. I wanted to ask you right off the bat, what is going on in the mortgage market? I have never seen anything like this in 32 years in the business of real estate where the difference in interest rates for one type of product like a, like a personal home versus another product like an investment property or second home is more than maybe a quarter of a percent difference. All of a sudden we're seeing like two, two percent differences. I mean, massive, like hundreds of dollars a month. What gives? I mean, sure. what happened? So essentially the FHFA came out and uh, stated that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, two of the single largest purchasers of mortgage-backed securities in the open market, had to limit their portfolio of both second homes and investment properties. To just, to clarify, just to clarify, a lot of people don't even know what that means. These are the people providing all the money for the mortgages. I mean, like most of the money in the country, right? Yeah, absolutely. What are you so, guys as conduits? And quite oftentimes what happens is, is any rule that hits Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, quite oftentimes many other people follow by, by nature. So what they did was they limited the amount of their overall portfolio that they could allow for second home and investment properties. And they made this bold announcement with really no um, explanation as to how it was going to affect lenders moving forward. So immediately what happened is the lending market seized on those second homes and investment properties until they could figure out where the dust was going to settle. So what that meant was that some lenders couldn't even do second homes or investment properties and those that could we're seeing quite elevated rates for the providers of those mortgages. Exceptionally. And yeah, so what we're seeing is that during COVID, there was a huge movement of second home purchases. Specifically. Uh, yeah. Historically, second homes have always been carrying interest rates very similar to that of primary residences, if not exactly the same. Investment properties have always been slightly higher, but now these mortgage mortgages are priced quite a bit higher than they have been in the past. And it's really due to a lot of the uncertainty as to how these mortgages are going to be purchased down the line. And as we continue to get more information, I think ultimately what we'll see is some of that discrepancy will settle out. We'll see it end up a little closer than it is now. But they really transformed the market with that announcement right away. Well, I, I was just running some numbers uh, and, and looking at some different quotes of interest rates on a single family home at 3%. And then an investment property at, at a little bit over five percent, and and it was just a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage. I mean, today that's you know first time buyer range still, and it was five hundred dollars a month in difference. I mean, it was it was incredible, and 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 it's if it here's my question, and I think you just started to answer it. That's going to crush, not crush. That's going to seriously depress. I don't want to exaggerate. It's just going to seriously depress. A lot of these second home markets that are reliant, these beach towns, these mountain towns, are reliant on that stuff. So you say it's it's going to come back down. I mean, 2% is unprecedented. And, and the difference is usually maybe a quarter. Do you think we'll see a quarter percent difference again? It's hard to judge where it's going to ultimately settle out at. But what's going to happen is if these numbers continue to stay in effect, which it it seems like it will, at least for the near near future, what will happen is a lot of this money will start flowing into what is called private markets, where it's not Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac backed. And there are investment companies out there that are going to purchase these mortgage backed loans and they're going to buy it based on their own criteria. So what it could mean is even if rates come down slightly, it's very likely that we could see the people who offer those loans now requiring stricter guidelines to okay. the uh, requirements of the borrower. It's interesting. I mean, the name of the show is the American dream because people are trying to buy a home. They're trying to retire. They're trying to buy a second home. Quite often, the second home isn't a second home just to vacation out. It's their, their sampling home because they might want to retire there quite often. Now people have literally told me, can't do it, can't buy right now. So 
what would be your recommendation? That they're scared. They can do it. They're scared sure. because the rate's too high. And then I point out, well, wait a minute. You're not going to lose money unless you don't buy. And I, I would like you to expand on that concept of the, the extra money of 500 bucks a month, which is 6000 a year, versus what houses are doing as far as appreciation. Yeah, well, just this year alone, I mean, Terry, I'm sure you can comment as to the uh, overall appreciation that we're seeing. And what we're looking at still, rate-wise, rates are historically at low levels. The buying power is still incredibly high compared to any time in history. Right. So even right. with slightly elevated rates, they're still on the lower end of the yield curve for what we've seen over the last 20 years. In addition to that, really what people need to focus on is finding lenders that have access to what's considered private money. That isn't necessarily going to be a loan that's sold just to Fannie Mae or to Freddie Mac. Mm. We've been fortunate enough to have a relationship with a banking institution over the years that is perfectly primed for situations like this because the asset itself, the second home right. property, have always performed well in terms of delinquency rates. And uh, what we're really starting to see and what you're going to see in the future is that banking operations that can be able to funnel mortgages through to those private money securities are going to ultimately get the majority of the line share of the business. So we, we have a massive schism in the market, basically. We all know, as you said, delinquency rates are, are low. In other words, it's an extremely safe investment for mortgage lenders to lend on second homes. It, it isn't justifying the higher rate. It's just that the government came in, and we don't even know why. That's what blows me away, and said, no, we, want, we, we don't want to be in that business anymore. So we're going to leave it to the private market. I mean, that's what is really happening. Right. Well, I mean, they're trying to disguise it under the, the onus that they really want to be in the primary mortgage market for people's uh, primary residences. However, what we're starting to see is that there will be these assets have performed well and investors for mortgage backed securities are looking for good yields. So they will jump into this marketplace. There will be outlets for second home and investment property purchases. They just might be at slightly higher qualifications and slightly right. higher risk than what we've seen in the past. So okay. it's just the lender that you work with is more important now than, than right. it ever has right. been. But let me, let, let me say on a scale of, of zero to 10, your confidence that these rates um, for second homes and investment properties won't have a two, two and a half percent uh, uh, difference. In other words, they won't be five and a half percent instead of three. They won't have that sh massive massive difference. I mean, that's almost 80% more uh, in, they won't, they won't have that kind of a gap. Uh, I mean, on a scale of one to 10, what in, in a year, year and a half, two years? Probably in eight. There's still wow. plenty, okay. plenty of people out there right. that want to purchase these type of loans. In fact, they're out there trying to purchase loans that are significantly riskier than this. And now okay. this is going to be a great window for them to jump into those marketplaces. Right. So then my advice for anybody looking to buy a second home or investment property is stay focused on the big game. Don't let the interest rate tail wag the dog here. The big game is uh, you could have made fifty to $80,000 on, on a median sized property in just the last year. Uh, we're going to show in a minute with some graphs and some evidence why we expect not only that, but a lot more than that to continue in appreciation. Don't trip over dollars to get to pennies. If you're going to lose $5,000 in interest, you get to pay a higher rate, refinance in a year. Get the property now so you don't lose the $50,000 in appreciation. And with your, your level of an eight on confidence, that's, that's pretty high for a banker. <laughs> You're comfortable. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the reality is, is, this is what I want to make very clear as well. There are lenders right now that have interest rates that are better than others because they have access to private money. And exactly. that part is important. That part is something that I want to make sure everybody understands is the lender that you work with specifically in this market that is so hyper competitive isn't only important for just helping you secure the contract, but also for developing the potential rate and product that you can land in. Yeah, yeah, that's important. And I, I, want, to, I want to jump into another topic here. I don't know how many times you get this, asked, this question asked to you lately, but anytime any market moves up, everyone thinks we're in a bubble just because the market's moving up. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and that's not the case. By the way, and bubbles aren't bad unless they're hyperinflated bubbles that are substantiated on nothing. And I wanted to give some evidence, but first I wanted to get your opinion before I go into mine on where you think we are in the real estate market as far as value is concerned. Are we in a bubble? If, we, if, if the market's going to continue going up, stay flat, go down. And I know this is 
your, 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 your answer is not going to be based on opinion. It's going to be based on a lot of the research from the Mortgage Bankers Association because you guys are at risk because you're lending the money if the market goes right. down. <clears throat> yeah, well, one of the best quotes I ever heard uh, in prediction and, and forecasting was from Dave Stevens. He said, never give an amount of time or, or a specific number. However, what I can tell you is this. Empirically, the structure of this at its base level is significantly different than what happened in 2008. There have the, the amount of regulation in mortgage banking and appraisal specifically right. that it's been going on since 2008 to now is significantly different than anything that we saw pre-crash well, in 2008. It's, it's against the law to do most of the loans that were done back then. And so what you're seeing is, is that the, the pool of buyers that own homes now from a qualification standpoint is stronger than any group that we've seen in recent history. Wow. And really what is driving this, really what is driving the majority of this giant influx in price is purely supply and demand. There are so many people who are qualified to buy, who are looking to buy, and there are so few homes for sale. And when the forbearance allotments or allowances were increased and continued to be delayed, that still kept an entire evolution of potential home, home purchases sitting on the sidelines. This is a supply and demand issue. This is not a quality of a buyer issue or people That's are right. buying homes that they can't afford. That's right. Yeah. So if we look at a graph, you can see that there, the affordability index, um, the amount that houses can go up from here before we even hit the levels at 2008, um, we, we can still climb a lot. I mean, we could look at another 50 to 100% appreciation before we even got to that level. And what's interesting, people think, oh, well, at that level is when the bubble would pop. No, based on what you just said, at that level, if we get to that level, we're getting to that level with high quality buyers and not buyers who are, who are paying interest only. And then their interest rates going to jump up in three years and they have to hand the keys in anyway. No, so it can keep going and going and going. And I, people always ask me, well, how high, how high can it go? I said, well, it can go, there is no, there is no top. Uh, and to evidence that, we're in the Washington, D.C. market, um, and we're looking at an average sales price of, you know, six seventy-five, seven hundred thousand, dollars and we're making 30% more average household income than people in San Francisco make. But people in San Francisco have an average sales price of well over $1.2 million. How do those numbers work? Why haven't they fallen? And if we get to $1.2 million, we still make more than San Francisco people make, so we could, make, we could, we could afford even more. That's the if. You just said it, it's supply and demand. The, su the limited supply and the continued limited supply of builders not being able to add enough homes back on the market because of supply constraints, because of smart zoning, uh, because of smart planning, because of uh, jurisdictions and areas not allowing them to build and overbuild, that's the problem. And so we're gonna be in this for a long time. So uh, look, I, I, I've done, I've done. TV, I've done radio, uh, I've done it for over 20 years, and most of it's sitting alongside, you know, stock jockeys, bond brokers, everything else. And it's fascinating for me now to see the amount of them who are putting their own money into real estate. Absolutely fascinating. And that speaks volumes. What, what's the real money doing? You know, what are the people doing who have actually uh, trying to give the advice out there? So I thought that was an interesting piece. Uh, Josh, any, any, final, any final comments? I think now more than ever, it's a great time to be partnered with people who are incredibly reputable in your, in your marketplace if you're looking to buy and if you're looking to get prepared to buy. That is, Perfect. we are still looking at historically low interest rates. So from a buying power standpoint, like Terry was mentioning before, it can be a really strong time if you're ready. You just have to be partnering with the right people. Yeah, no, it's critical on any market, especially now. Yeah, Josh, thank you very much for uh, joining us in the American Dream. This is Terry Roche. Stay tuned.